Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here to kick off the first webinar in our new Esri State and Local webinar series. And this was a series that was created by Esri State and Local Government team for you. You're all practitioners who want to improve the work that you're doing with GIS. My name is Rachel Whedon, and I work in the Philadelphia area where I manage our Mid-Atlantic team. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Anthony Puzo. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Yolanda Richards. Hello, everybody. And Matt Viverito. Hey, everybody. And we'll be hearing from John and Lauren in our webinar as well. So as I said, this webinar was crafted by Esri State and Local Government Team. We have over 200 people at Esri who are dedicated specifically to this market. And we work as a distributed team across the United States. We serve nine distinct geographic regions. And as a company that's deeply rooted in geography, we really value the benefits of this regional approach. Now, of course, right now, most of us are working from home, but that doesn't change our ability to connect with you and provide assistance as needed. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to do this webinar series. You know, a lot of us are really missing out on those opportunities to connect with in-person events and meetings where we can hear directly from you about your challenges and the work that you're doing uh, and how Esri can help them. So the topics that we'll be covering over the next few months really represent what we see as the most important things that our government users should be focused on. So I do hope you'll register for the entire uh, webinar series. So as we get started today, I'll remind everyone that we do plan to make the recording available for this webinar. You can also ask any questions um, in the questions pane in GoToWebinar that you might have, and we'll go ahead and address those at the end. We'll have plenty of time for questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, what we'll be focusing on are our key takeaways from the Esri User Conference. And I'm sure a lot of you on today's webinar were able to attend virtually the User Conference this summer. And I was really excited to hear we had over 85,000 people register. Of course, the UC looked a little bit different where we had presenters who were joining from their offices or their own personal stages rather than the big convention center in San Diego. But that didn't change how much content we were able to pack into the conference, whether it was the plenary or the tech workshops. So today what we wanna do is talk through some of the highlights and the topics that we feel are especially relevant for you. And as always, the UC plenary highlighted a lot of different aspects of the ArcGIS platform and all sorts of new features. But my favorite part of the plenary was how it framed the use of ArcGIS in the context of the real work that we're all doing in the midst of these challenging times. And we'd like to do the same today. So as we walk through our takeaways, we'll also be highlighting the work that you're doing and we can all take inspiration from it. Our time today will be organized into three distinct topics. First, web apps in action, followed by innovations in field work, and we'll wrap up with next generation desktop GIS. So let's go ahead and get started with our first topic. Of course, you know, we continue to see a growing use of web applications. And I think that one reason why is that they engage people in a way that a traditional GIS can't. And we also see web apps being used in ways that solve real world challenges of government. They're not really those um, kind of typical standalone GIS applications. Rather, what we're seeing now are focused tools that support a lot of different aspects of government work, whether that be planning meetings, uh, elections, public health outreach, and so much more. And of course, web apps are quicker than ever to deploy, which makes them a great tool to use in times of urgency. So to start this section, my colleague John Ruffing will share an example of how the ArcGIS web apps have served state and local governments responding to the wildfires in Oregon. Hi, my name is John Ruffing. I'm a representative for Esri with the cities and counties within Oregon. Um, and I wanted to cover today uh, the stories that most of you might be hearing um, out of Oregon around the current wildfires that we've been having. Uh, they've been really devastating the state and affecting a lot of the counties here. And I'm going to jump to the quick article and show you folks what we're looking at here uh, in regards to the wildfires. Um, kind of a quick recap, they are the largest wildfires in history of Oregon. Uh, over a million acres have been burned and up to 20% of Oregonians have been evacuated from their homes. So the extent of these wildfires and how they've crossed all different counties and boundaries and cities uh, within the state is, is, is massive. So really what we have here, um, the Oregon Emergency Management, the state, 
in the local counties are using in the context of WebGIS to collaborate and share the evacuation boundaries in real time for the individual counties and up to the state to have a holistic view of the evacuation boundaries. And, and what we have prior to really leveraging the WebGIS was siloed off evacuation boundaries that each county did that was hard for the state to receive and then also share out within their apps and vice versa for the counties. And as we know, this information is very important because this is, you know, with the fires evolving rapidly. So this getting this information out instantly to the public um, is very helpful for folks to have. And what we have with the WebGIS is really an authoritative compensate layer that the locals have access to. And you can see here, Steve Barnett, he is um, out of Lynn County and he is editing through PRO, as are all the other counties, a service that the state has set up of the evacuation boundaries. This is shared up to the state and vice versa back down. Um, and this really alleviates a lot of the redundant work the counties are doing and ultimately really how they're sharing this information back to each other and then ingesting that into their web apps through WebGIS ultimately is making it, you know, have the evacuation boundaries get out to people so that it's better communicated, uh, it's faster, it's smoother for folks to see, and really ultimately saving lives, which is the most important uh, part of this. And the app that you have um, shown here through Steve is getting over a thousand, hundred thousand hits per hour. Uh, and so they were following along with all the other counties in the state, the best practices for when you have WebGIS and you have apps up online, how that scalability for uh, use when getting hit by a large amount of visitors. So, you know, this is really one example of how WebGIS is being used currently uh, with the wildfires in Oregon. Thanks. In the story that John shared, the web apps really provided a collaborative framework for wildfire response. And now I'll hand it over to Anthony. He's going to share how the state of Maryland is using a variety of web applications for their COVID-19 response. Anthony? All right, thank you, Rachel. Obviously, we've all been dealing with this pandemic over the last six or seven months, and it's been a huge issue across the world. Uh, but a lot of our state and local customers have been using GIS as a way to communicate with the public, to uh, show data in real time about what's going on in their in their local jurisdictions, and to and to share resources about how how people can get help. We have over 40 states using uh, GIS as a main component of their, their COVID outreach. But the state of Maryland has been doing this uh, since their, their launch on March 14th, 2020 at 5 a.m. And they're using an ArcGIS Hub site to frame all of their information into one place. Since then, they've seen over 51 million page, page views and 8 million users of all of their key components, which includes their dashboards and information products. These dash dashboards are showing things like a uh, number of cases by county and by zip code, number of hospitalizations, tests, and trend lines about what's going on in each one of those jurisdictions. They're also sharing the actual raw data components for each one of those data sets. So not only are they showing the information products, but they're also sharing the data endpoints. So you can get access to the data in, uh, by a KML, a shapefile, or a CSV or through an API that's, that's easily accessible through any kind of web application. This is really important because this shows the actual data, has the transparency, and uh, can share that out to local jurisdictions or partners or businesses. Like in this case, there are also, uh, the Baltimore County is also using the same information for their COVID response with the context of their information. They're also pulling out um, lots of other information products uh, using GIS, including where to get testing. So this this uh, new testing page on their 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 COVID site shows where drive-through locations are, where walk-up centers are, where uh, pharmacies are are located. How you get access to it, driving locations. You can even schedule testing results right through this application. This is all done through a, a, a new web application, a configurable application called Nearby, which is available in ArcGIS. They're also sharing out dashboards without any maps. So this is more uh, um, tabular information through their contact tracing information. So 
Their COVID link is their contact tracing uh, setup hosted through a various number of systems, but the public end of things, and they're showing trends and marketplaces on what's going on inside the communities and showcasing that through, through their, their hub site. This is all available on, at coronavirus.maryland.gov. This is their main webpage. And them, just like other jurisdictions, are sharing out very uh, important information through GIS. This is made possible through, uh, through the, the configurable applications that are delivered through ArcGIS. And Matt's gonna show us a little bit more uh, examples about those applications and how they can get put to use. Yeah, so thanks, Anthony. Um, so yeah, Maryland is a great example of an agency using a variety of configurable apps to help solve a really complex problem. Prior to joining Esri as a solution engineer, I worked as a one-man GIS shop for a local government. I was definitely not a developer. I'm still not a developer. So I relied heavily on Web App Builder and App Studio to quickly be able to configure applications and deploy it to my end users that met their business needs. Um, today, our newest application that I'd like to discuss is called Experience Builder. And this gives you even more flexibility, more tools, and more capabilities that, the, that a developer might have. I like to, to call it custom configuration. So what is Experience Builder? So ArcGIS Experience Builder is a no-code, low-code platform for building web experiences using your GIS content. Without writing any code, you can create web apps and maps and pages using out-of-the-box templates, drag and drop widgets, and configurable layouts that adapt to different screen sizes. Even if you are a developer, you still can use code to extend the application and also build custom widgets. So recently, we've seen a lot of state and local government agencies using Experience Builder in response to COVID-19. So for example, what you're seeing here is ArcGIS dashboards, but these dashboards are actually embedded in Experience Builder. And the reason they decided to do this was they wanted to be able to allow access to um, these dashboards in different views, but from a single uh, application. And what I mean by that is they had a web version and a mobile version. So essentially they could create a web version and a mobile version and they could access that application from a single URL. But Experience Builder can do much more than just make uh, your app mobile friendly. You have the ability to customize the functionality, the look and feel, and how users interact with it. Again, I like to call this custom configuration. So here are a few examples. Uh, the Mid-America Regional Council for, in Missouri created a COVID-19 data application using configurable widgets, indicators, and multiple pages for the users to interact with. New York City decided to use a scrolling uh, page to, web page template that displays all of their COVID response maps. And Delaware County is using an integrated Survey123 to capture detailed and interactive information about their local restaurants. Experience Builder is our newest and by far our most flexible application that allows you to even do more with low code or no code. Experience Builder is just the latest way that you can configure your own web maps and apps. We still have options like a very popular story maps that have just been updated with some new, new technology, new information there. We have configurable apps in ArcGIS Online, our very popular dashboards that have been used heavily for the COVID-19 response. ArcGIS Hub, which is part of every ArcGIS Online application and, and platform. So you can create your own websites and landing page and engagement tools. Web app builders to have uh, more focused map applications. We also offer a variety of different starter kits with ArcGIS solutions. This is a way that we've taken common business problems and created templates for you to use, to use these same applications and use them for your own organization. We leverage these solutions in a recent um, activity with uh, the State of Georgia Elections Department, with the Secretary of State in partnership with Fulton County. They had a recent runoff location and they were interested on reporting wait times and service tickets by some of the, the polling places and report that up to a dashboard in the Secretary of State's office. They really were interested in what wait times were gonna be and where tech support issues are gonna happen. So within a couple of days, we were able to configure a Survey123 app using some of the solutions available in the wait times uh, solution template and uh, a, a dashboard so we can report that in real time. 
So the polling place locator actually could, could write down the number of uh, minutes of wait time, You'd enter that into a survey one, two, three, and that would roll up into a dashboard in the Secretary of State's office so they get visualization about what's going on in each one of the polling places. They didn't have that, that view before, and they got this quickly configured within a week or so. This is the point of using Artria Solutions, and Lauren's going to go through a little bit more detail about Artria Solutions and how you can use those in your organization. There are hundreds of ArcGIS solutions, and these solutions cross a wide range of practice and disciplines. Solutions are developed around observed needs in the community and created with you in mind to help you manage your authoritative location-based data, understand community conditions, deploy operational systems, and where appropriate, facilitate public engagement. Each solution contains a collection of useful maps and apps that are configurable out of the box and extensible. They are freely available and fully supported by Esri. Solutions.arcgis.com provides you with information on all available solutions. You can search by category or scroll through the site. There's even a gallery tab where you can search the solution gallery and filter results by industry, application, or implementation pattern. But my favorite way to explore solutions is by using the new ArcGIS Solutions app in ArcGIS Online. In your ArcGIS Online organization, go to the App Launcher and choose Solutions. Browse or search for the solution you wish to deploy. Click the thumbnail to view details, and if you'd still like more information, you can choose Learn More. This will take you to the solution page where you can read an overview of the solution, view requirements, what comes with the solution, and any additional information that's unique to a particular solution. I think it's important to note that right now the Solutions app only contains a subset of all solutions that are available, but solutions are being added at regular intervals. So the main entry point is still going to be through the Solutions website and the Solutions gallery. And don't forget, you can still deploy solutions using the ArcGIS Solution Deployment tool in ArcGIS Pro, but the Solutions app makes it much quicker and easier to get started. When you're ready to deploy, choose Get Now on the Solutions app. This will deploy the solution and all of the contents to your ArcGIS Online organization. After the solution has been deployed, you'll see it in the My Solutions tab. Click to open the new solution item, which organizes solution content so that you can see how each item is related within the solution. So in this example, if I wanted to utilize the Racial Equity and Inclusion Community Survey to request citizen feedback on racial equity initiatives, I would need to configure the feature layer and the survey item you see listed here. If I'm viewing the solution through my content, you'll find that all of the items have been added for me in a folder in your content as well as that new solution item. ArcGIS Solutions for State and Local Government provide you with a great first step in helping you solve some really big challenges faced by your organizations. Don't forget to check out a later webinar dedicated solely to solutions for state and local government. Back to you, Rachel. So I want to reiterate something that Lauren touched on before we move on to our next topic. What she really described were over 100 applications that can be deployed in a full SaaS or software as service deployment option for government. So it gives you a great place to get started. So what we're going to do now is shift gears into our next topic, innovations in field work. Yolanda? Thank you, Rachel. So ArcGIS has a full suite of apps that support different phases of field work. Some of you may be using Quick Capture, which is one of our newest apps for collecting information. Along with traditional data capture, it's actually worth noting that we have apps to support drone data capture. So the next slide shows the simplicity of the drone application focused on flight planning, collection, and processing. Ezra utilizes drone mapping technology that helps bring drone imagery into your GIS built environment. One of our newer products within the ArcGIS ecosystem is called SiteScan, which is a cloud-based solution that provides automated drone flight planning, drone fleet management, and image processing and analysis. 
With this complete drone data platform, you can use either ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise, where users can use analytical tools within their respective environments. So drone data workflow can be captured in three categories, which include one, plan and capture, two, process, manage and analyze, and then finally three, disseminate and collaborate. And so as we go into the next slide, you'll notice that this animation will demonstrate the simplicity of SiteScan. You can see how the drone will actually calculate a path and then do optimal image overlapping to create high quality base maps as well as point clouds and 3D meshes within SiteScan. It is then automatically stored and managed in the cloud. All to say drones are becoming much more easier to use in this day and age, where SiteScan for ArcGIS is a user-friendly um, process for your drone workflows using only simple pieces of equipment. All you really need is your drone, the drone controller, and then an iPad or a mobile device to use the SiteScan app. Excellent, thank you, Yolanda. As Yolanda outlined, we have a full platform for field operations. In keeping the theme of innovative field work, we've coordinated our monitoring, coordination, planning, navigating, and capturing into one app. That new app is Arceus Field Maps. We've listened to our users and they wanted one experience to bring in all these different uh, features into one application. With field maps, you'll be able to do simple viewing and markups, high accuracy field data collection in the field, uh, battery optimized location tracking, turn by turn navigation, and this revolutionary new app. This is in beta now, and it'll be, it'll be scheduled to release at the end of this year. You can use the QR code on the screen here to get access to the new beta. This will hopefully help revolutionize the way you do uh, field data collection. And as just as the mobile device is a sensor in the field, ArcGIS is consuming lots and lots of different sensor information, whether it's IoT data, traffic information, AVL, buses, weather feeds, whatever that real-time data feed is, ArcGIS can in in ingest that information and make sense out of it. We still use that uh, geo event server in enterprise and geoanalytics server to handle that big data processing in real time. That's not going anywhere, but we're also introducing a brand new uh, SaaS solution called ArcGIS Velocity. This will actually combine the, the usage of, of GeoVent and GeoAnalytics into one place so you can schedule in real time all of your, your large data items and do analytics on the fly within this SaaS solution. Look for this coming out in the next few weeks, and this will be a powerful new addition to your ArcGIS stack and be able to schedule huge data sets in real time and make use of that wherever you want it. Awesome, thanks Anthony. We're gonna transition into our final topic of the day and I'd like to walk you through some advances that are relevant to uh, all you desktop users out there. So one of the most useful ways that the ArcGIS platform supports desktop users is by providing content that's ready to use right out of the box. And the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World is that collection of content that we offer you. Of course, it includes the base maps. I know many of you use those regularly. It's worth noting that our base maps are now vector format. And just a couple of things to highlight uh, benefits of, the, of that vector format. First is your base maps are gonna look sharper and crisper on any device. And secondly, you have enhanced design options. So you can really go in and change the look and feel of those base maps to meet your own needs. I'll also point out a recent enhancement with OpenStreetMap. We now provide continuous updates so that you can see the latest OSM edits, whether you're working online or offline. Of course, Living Atlas goes well beyond the base maps. We have a lot of content that helps you address the complex challenges that your communities might be facing. And I wanted to point out a variety of the real-time data sets, some of which are really relevant right now, um, including content on air quality and smoke forecast, hurricanes and storms, flooding, social distancing, and a whole lot more. We're always looking to update the content that we make available. For example, this summer, as we launched a new racial equity initiative, and this included a data hub. And the data hub has an ever-growing collection of content that's curated to help communities specifically address issues of equity. And this is where you can find ready-to-use maps on a variety of subjects. That could be demographic, 
distributions, race-related health outcomes, and even restrictive housing practices. I like to think of ArcGIS Pro as the heart of desktop GIS, and Pro continues to advance. We've had over five years to bring up the capabilities in line with what you had come to know and love with ArcMap. And now what you'll see is improvements and features are actually exceeding what you can do with ArcMap. And that's because ArcGIS Pro is where all of Esri's development is taking place. So one example of a new capability is Locate XT. This is an extension that gives you a simple way to create geographic data from unstructured text. So imagine a text file and being able to pull out things like coordinates, place names, geotags, and create that GIS layer. I was also really interested to hear about the new suitability modeler. It's a newer and simpler experience for doing those complex weighted overlays in Pro. Speaking of analysis, another new analysis feature is related to parcels, and that's the new least squares adjustment tool. And this really helps with data accuracy and consistency when you're editing with the parcel fabric. Map graphics are a fun and easy way to enhance and style your maps, and you don't need to create a new data set to add different characteristics to your maps with map graphics. So those are just a few of the newer enhancements in Pro. By the end of the year, you'll see the 2.7 version released, and there'll be even more capabilities to support your work. We keep adding new capabilities to Pro, but it's worth noting that even the everyday tasks that you support, like data editing, are improved with Pro. And I wanted to share a quick example from the city of Philadelphia. They use ArcGIS Pro to create and manage their address point data set, which of course supports their next gen 911 initiatives. And they place address points on actual building entrances. That's over 800,000 points for the entire city. And using the unique tools that ArcGIS Pro has, like feature templates and tasks, this really shortens the time it takes for them to do their work. And of course, the performance enhancements in Pro make it easy to handle the display and editing of these large data sets. ArcGIS Pro has a lot of capabilities. We know that it covers your work with data management, mapping, spatial data science, and 3D. But don't make the mistake of thinking about Pro as a standalone desktop application. In fact, it's actually connected to the geospatial cloud, to the rest of the ArcGIS platform. ArcGIS Pro might often be the starting point for your maps and data, but with the sharing capabilities that we have, the ability to access content, the ability to deploy applications like Lauren shared, as well as integrating with your other business workflows, you can see how ArcGIS really lets your work take on much more meaning. Anthony? Thanks, Rachel. Those improvements in ArcGIS Pro are pretty amazing. What's next for Esri technology? Well, as your work advances, so does the, the continued advancement and innovation at Esri to make sure that we're staying up with IT patterns and services across the IT landscape and keeping up with uh, different security protocols and other applications that you may need from the user base. Right now we're at uh, ArcGIS 10.81 and next year we'll be at 2021, a new naming convention for next year. A couple of the items that I'm really interested in as we go into next year is an entirely new Arceus Enterprise deployment tool on Kubernetes. This is a microservices environment heavily asked for by the user community, and this will be a way that you can um, deploy Arceus Enterprise into more of a um, more scalable environment. We continue to provide out SaaS applications, software as a service applications, include the use of BIM technology into things like our indoor programs, ingest more and more sensors from the field like IoT, that Arceus Velocity looks like a really good option to bring in real-time information and scheduling analytics on top of it, providing more cloud-native environments through our applications and patterns. And some of the things I'm really interested in is our advancements in AI and machine learning. We'll bring that right to the tools in Arceus Pro and right to our web applications so you can use them and consume them without needing to do a lot of um, deploying and, and, and developing on your own. These are all for the common purpose to advance the use of GIS so you can do your work better, faster, and cheaper. Our intention here today was to give you a little bit of the cliff notes and highlights from Ezra User Conference. Obviously, there was hundreds of different um, user, uh, user presentations, demos, technical workshops uh, that are still available through the Ezra UC website. A lot of those, a lot of those um, sessions will be available on YouTube here shortly. So what we covered today was uh, some web maps in action. Uh, 
we're seeing a huge amount of increase in the use of ArcGIS applications helping solve and communicate today's biggest challenges like wildfires out west, COVID-19, um, and, some, and some other uh, big challenges. We see the continued innovation in our field workforce, uh, our field operations uh, uh, platform. So you can be able to provide the tools where and where necessary to knowledge workers, people in the field, and we have a full uh, drone and imagery platform to consume that, uh, capture that information and consume that information. And then we continue to look at the GIS professional and innovate that desktop. So it becomes the nucleus of the entire platform so you can do your, your, your job faster and better. Yolanda's gonna take us through a little bit how uh, Esri can support your work. Yolanda? You're on mute. So there's actually several ways in which Esri can support you and your organizations. First and foremost, I really wanted to highlight that we are a company that prides itself in valuing people, technology, and the built environment to truly make positive impact in this world. And so we take that seriously as a company and our vision to see what others can't really highlights just that. And so, as I mentioned, there's a lot of ways in which Esri wants to be intentional to support, but I believe these areas that I'm gonna talk about really speak to the mission and the vision of who we are as um, an organization. And so to start off with, as we really believe in relationship building, period. Um, it's the core of who we are, and we value those relationships that we have with our customers, with our partners, and organizations that see locational intelligence as a problem solver. So from issues related to racial inequity and social justice to the disaster re response program that we have and offer, as we continue to work side by side with our customers, where you're supported and you're not alone. And so we do our due diligence in making sure that your teams have the resources and are equipped in being successful. As we also offer is extensive training and professional development where you're equipped with the resources and the tools to implement your projects and your workflows. Our Esri Academy provides both free and paid training offerings that are vast and customized for your areas of interest. And so we wanna ensure that we can empower you with the technology but also making sure that you're feeling empowered to launch your specific projects and workflows. And so with strategic guidance, we are a team of storytellers, data analysts, demographers, and geographers, and we have a lot of cross-sector experience and we're committed to working with you side by side to implement and build your solutions. Last but not least, Esri has an amazing partner uh, network of organizations that can further assist you and your teams with the services that you need and helping you to further leverage your latest capabilities. And so from these areas, Esri really wants to ensure that we are meeting our customers where they're at so they can be successful. successful. So yeah, so I encourage everybody to visit our uh, hub site where you can um, contact the speakers directly. We have our uh, uh, information there and some fun facts. Um, you can also register for future webinars coming up. And then those videos on all the subjects that we talked about that uh, UC provided us, they'll be available on this website as well. Thanks, Matt, for uh, putting that hub site together. I think uh, collecting those resources will be really useful for people. Um, so just as we're wrapping up today, I did want to bring up the details of our next session. Our director of state and local government team, Christian Carlson, We'll be doing a deep dive on the SaaS offerings that Lauren and a few of us touched on today. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Uh, we do have time for questions today. So let's go ahead and see what questions we have and we can address those for you. Um, Anthony, I'll give you this question. Uh, someone noticed, um, you know, we, we mentioned Hub, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. Is Hub still a uh, configurable web application tool that's available for people to use. Unmute. The famous year 2020 line, I'm on mute. Um, yeah, Hub is definitely a huge part of our platform. We're actually seeing significant growth in the use of Hub for communicating um, either programs, like I talked about the state of Maryland's coronavirus site, uh, engagement tools for crowdsourcing information or just uh, still open data platforms and those 
significant amount of growth there. It's kind of become a little omnipresent with a lot of our different offerings and how we combine those things. So we haven't talked about it specifically on its own, but it's kind of in everything that we de deploy. So I know Matt and I, uh, oftentimes when we're, when we're delivering a solution, we'll deliver that in a hub site uh, as a way to frame the context around the content that's in there. Yeah, thanks. Um, and maybe a related question. Um, someone, uh, someone else pointed out that uh, we didn't mention the uh, map viewer, another kind of new enhancement that was released uh, or mentioned at the user conference, the ArcGIS Online Map Viewer. Matt, do you mind um, just sharing a little yes. bit more about that? Yeah, so Map Viewer is going to be our uh, next generation Map Viewer for ArcGIS Online. Um, right now it's in beta, but we'll be released it by the end of the year. Cool. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, go ahead and continue to type those in. We'll do uh, a couple of uh, other ones as we see them coming in. Oh, another, uh, maybe a follow-up on the hub conversation. Um, question came in, have you seen local governments create sites or hubs for various departments for internal use? Uh, Anthony or Matt, for do you want to address that? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, so you want me to take ahead. that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, we have seen uh, a lot of that use for uh, using hub for, for departmental use. Um, sometimes uh, in ArcGIS Enterprise, if you're using our enterprise solution, we have enterprise sites that are built into that. So sometimes if you're doing internal facing applications, you might use enterprise sites, but you can also use ArcGIS Hub to, uh, to design those same sites and then have sign-in capabilities so you can view those sites for, uh, for viewing purposes. Matt, were you gonna add something different? Yeah, I'm just gonna say, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, agencies use it for internal collaboration or to extend out to maybe other agencies across the state for data collection, for example. So um, a big use of Hub is for that collaboration piece uh, internally and externally. Yeah. Yolanda, did you have something to add to that? I see you nodding your head. Yeah, I think um, what's, yeah, um, what's been really powerful is that you're starting to see, as uh, Matt mentioned, um, you might have a specific department that is utilizing Hub to kind of focus on their workflows. But again, there's a lot of synergy and a lot of collaboration that's taking place as well. So you're seeing cross uh, departmental collaboration taking place, and it's really powerful because there might be a centralized issue, whether it be COVID or maybe a particular area that several departments are working on, and you're seeing Hub as a way to really integrate and bring people together, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, so someone is asking about ArcGIS solutions. Uh, they know that there are a lot of solutions out there, but are curious which are the most popular. So I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, thinking specifically about the state and local government industry, I would say that one of the most common applications that we've seen a lot of deployment around is the citizen problem reporter. That's a tool that citizens can use to report non-emergency, uh, like 311 incidents. And the nice thing about that solution is it has the public facing reporter view, it has internal manager views, and it has all the tools you need to manage uh, addressing those citizen problem reports. Uh, so it's a complete end-to-end -end solution. So I know that's been really popular, especially for governments who uh, need tools to do that, and they can you know, deploy that solution uh, with no additional licensing typically that they might already have with ArcGIS. Um, another one that comes to mind are the 3D base map solutions. Might be, uh, you know, again, one specific to local governments, but for folks who are looking to get started with 3D base maps, this is an ArcGIS Pro solution uh, that pretty much walks you through the recipe of creating 3D base maps at a variety of levels of detail. So that one's really neat. Um, and then my personal favorite solution, uh, something I wish that I had at my last job many years ago is the Crime Analysis Toolkit for ArcGIS Pro. Um, that's something that is, uh, again, specific for crime analysts. They have very um, particular ways that they need to slice and dice data or visualize it on the map. And that toolbar in Pro just makes it so much uh, easier. So I definitely uh, would suggest checking that out if you work in law enforcement. Yeah. Hey, Rachel, can I just add, I think that um, yeah. that tool can be used, some of the tools in there can be used for non-crime analysis as well. So it might be worth it oh, even yeah? if you're not in the crime industry um, to take a look at it. It's an, an add-on that you can download to Pro. Um, and I think there's some value there for just everyday uh, GIS production type work. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe like any sort of incident layer. Again, like thinking about those 311 incidents or other mm -hmm. things that maybe citizens are reporting on or something. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. We also, uh, can, I, can I add one more in there? Yeah. Um, there, we have a whole, solu a whole set of solutions for, uh, for dedicated for coronavirus. Um, 
for response, like dashboards and other things, looking at 14-day trends that are based on some of the NGA and White House um, uh, data inputs that, that, that they're asking for. There's also a whole back to work set of solutions for uh, things like you know, reporting uh, people's temperature and who's out of work and who's working from home. And then uh, that site selection of, of, uh, of, of space management on your actual office configuration. So there's kind of a whole set of different um, solution templates that you can spin up and launch um, right in our SaaS environment in ArcGIS Online all dedicated for that kind of uh, response and recovery and back to work scenarios for uh, for coronavirus. Yeah, that really sees uh, people through that full life cycle. So that's really great to hear. Um, looks like we had a couple of questions on velocity that might be um, new. So just a, a quick note there that uh, ArcGIS Velocity is a new naming convention um, that we're rolling out for that. Uh, that new real-time capability. Um, but one question came in about whether or not uh, Velocity uh, replaces GeoEvent. Um, Anthony, I know you mentioned that on your slide. Do you wanna take that question? Yeah, it does not replace GeoEvent. So GeoEvent will still have that as a, as a server option uh, for, for enterprise in the cloud or on-premise. Uh, we'll still have Geo, Geo Analytics. Uh, Velocity is going to be a new SaaS offering. So it's kind of an all built in one SaaS offering. It's going to be a subscription service. It's actually entirely built on Kubernetes. So it's a scalable environment and allow you to do a lot of the real time processing and analytics on the fly right in that, uh, right in that system. And that you could bring to your web apps, dashboards, story maps, um, uh, web app builder applications. So you can still build those feeds in there, but it'll be a SaaS uh, software as a service subscription that you can add to your stack and you can add to your your uh, geo event server so uh, it could be a nice complement to, to a lot of that yeah and that kind of clarifies another question someone asked um, for clarity around whether or not velocity was a SaaS offering or an extension to enterprise I think you addressed that um, yeah. and the other thing that that you'll see with um, with ArcGIS velocity is that it will because it's a SaaS offering it means that we can offer different options for people, whether they need a lot or a little, uh, there'll be um, you know, multiple ways that you can use ArcGIS Velocity to meet your needs. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that as well. Exactly. Well, I think we've been able to address most of the questions that have come in uh, and we're just about at our time. Um, so I think with that, we'll wrap it up for today. Again, we'll make the recording available. You can check out the hub site that Matt uh, highlighted to access the recording. And again, our contact information, we'd be happy to chat with you or email with you about any questions or follow-up that you might have from today. So thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.